Welcome to GUI and in web browsers, weekly call about stuff related to those things and other things around IPFS. Um, today is 4th of uh, September, I think, 2019. And let's quickly jump to agenda. If uh, anyone has any last moment topics, drop them to agenda. I just started because uh, like the first item is mine, so that will be smooth transition. Um, I wanted to give a quick progress report on uh, work around embedded JS IPFS in Brave. So there's a uh, there's a long list of things, um, and one of those things is local discovery and UDP and TCP transports. You can see those are not checked here yet. However, I should be able to give a quick demo to see where we are with that today. So I got uh, Brave Nightly, and I've uh, built uh, IPFS Compile from the like, developer branch locally to make it faster to demo. But it will be soon submitted as a PR. So I started uh, IPFS Companion, and you can see it's offline because I don't have uh, Go IPFS running locally. It's just browser extension, and it's like in offline mode. So that's sad, but well, um, you can always like look at the console of the browser extension, and it's offline. <laughs> uh, but now we should be able to go to, oh, let me move this, all right. We should be able to go to uh, settings and switch to embedded node. And in Brave, embedded node has access to Chrome sockets APIs. So now when we switch to that, various stuff will happen on the right side of the screen. Um, so I will scroll up. Here you can see we got 11 peers already. And I should be able to open Web UI. Uh, the first time I open it may be slow because it's not cached locally. It's fetched from IPFS network. Um, but eventually, all the assets will load. Um, however, on the right side, you can see the startup process of uh, the embedded node in IPFS Companion inside of Brave. Yeah, so on the left side, Web UI loaded, you can see it's embedded JS IPFS. And let's go to the peer screen. Um, and we can see we got 11 peers, and those peers are connected with TCP. How did that happen? Um, and why, why those two are like unknown? That's interesting. So on the right side, we can see uh, embedded node started, but there's an interesting tidbit here. There's a local DNS discovery enabled. And if we scroll, or maybe if we filter it out, you can see that MDNS, uh, local MDNS uh, lookup happens every 10 seconds, I think. And my Go IPFS instance running on a different machine on the same network was just discovered by JS IPFS embedded uh, inside of Brave, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's a demonstration of both TCP transport, because all those bootstrap nodes here, maybe if I go to settings, it will be more obvious. Um, let me like, yep. So <laughs> the bootstrap section here is a bit big. However, it's big for a reason, because I've put all the bootstrap addresses from, uh, node setup, which are just TCP addresses. There are also 
WebSocket addresses. And the preload nodes are listed as both uh, WebSocket and TCP addresses. So what's interesting is that the order matters. So if the first address is TCP1 and not WebSocket, it will be used. Uh, I think if we, uh, right now, the embedded node can run both WebSocket and TCP transport, which means it can connect to both uh, nodes uh, listening on like WebSocket transport, but also like regular Go IPFS without that. Um, but we want to prioritize TCP probably for performance issues, uh, for performance reasons. Um, at this point, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, mostly experimenting with bootstraps and it seems to work fine. It's picking up uh, the TCP ones and I confirm the connections, uh, are listed, uh, the connections li established by JS IPFS running in brave are TCP even if we got both specified in the bootstrap nodes. So that's kind of interesting. So what's, what's next? Uh, I stopped sharing so I can see you and I see there are questions. Uh, however, uh, what's next for this is to uh, ensure, like we can discover other nodes. The next step is to ensure other nodes can discover our embedded node. And uh, then we would have to brave browsers able to discover each other. Right now, Brave Browser is able to discover your local Go IPFS node, but it does not like announce itself. And the separate topic is we don't have DHT yet. I tried uh, enabling DHT, but it was not, uh, like it was uh, using all the CPU, so there's some uh, performance issue somewhere. And uh, we could use delegated routing for until the DHT is ready, however, that opens a lot of questions around uh, performance um, of the preload nodes and delegate roads, uh, nodes. So um, that's, the, that's the, like a, just a, an update where we are. So the next step is to figure out how to announce ourselves uh, to the network using local, uh, for local DNS discovery to work. And then probably we'll invest some time to get DHT to the point where we don't need any third party uh, notes. Any questions? Sorry for a bit long update. I think Alan was first and then Dietrich. Uh, this is super cool. Uh, I am very excited. And uh, looks great. I have a question regarding like the so the discovery and the transport, like how are they how are they built? Are they like a separate module or are you just using different, like is it a fork of the existing ones with different requires or like how, how, how is it working and can you like link to them so that I can just have a look because I'm really interested. So that, this is where it gets interesting because those are the same modules uh, JSAPFS is using in Node. So, and this is also... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so the magic is just to polyfill uh, and to polyfill stuff. Uh, so we had to polyfill various places and fix smaller or bigger bugs in libraries when we wanted to open, uh, when we wanted to run happy in, in, the, in the same context, because that was like opening TCP port. Uh, the TCP transport itself is similar. It's using the same polyfill on, uh, on, uh, for net module. Um, and that's good because the same code works and we don't need to maintain a separate module. The problem is I'm not sure I need to look if we can make it uh, discoverable itself. Because right now the transport is mostly in the client mode. I'm able to like connect to multi others, TCP multi others, but I'm not sure if I'm others are able to connect to me. Uh, I need to, see how uh, it's like the TCP transport itself is wired in uh, JSAPFS, so it updates, it's like adds its own uh, TCP address to its list, to the list of its own addresses right now. Uh, as far as I was able to see, the JSAPFS in Brave does not add any IPv4 addresses, so I think it's like added somewhere else. Um, so 
either we figure it out that in user land or we just write the custom module. Uh, the, the, like that, the writing custom module is uh, always an option. It's just like the worst case scenario. I would really like to reuse the same code base. Uh, to not, uh, like yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Can, can you share the polyfills you're using or where, like, can I, oh, can yeah. You, like, yeah. point me to the place in the code where it's happening and, sure, like, I, I can link you, uh, I will open a PR, but I can link you to a branch I have. So, yeah, you don't have to do it now, but like, if you want to yeah. put it in the document or something, that would oh, be yeah, great. yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we use the same polyfills. Uh, it's just a matter of, con of configuration. We probably will um, to have uh, support for things like uh, uh, WebSocket Star, this WebSocket Star Multi. We would need to uh, create a custom lp2p bundler function because right now I'm just like passing the config. But uh, for more advanced setup, we'll need to create a custom bundle. Um, Dietrich, you had a question. I, mean, I, I, I kind of had a same, similar question as Alan. I, I think it would be really useful to share kind of the overall architecture approach that you used. So if there's uh, either some documentation about how you went through that process of building the polyfills, where they, where they live. So like, you know, you're polyfilling node APIs that live in the web extension context of a certain browser that our regular JSIPFS code can uh, it thinks it's in a friendly environment. It supports all the stuff that it needs, uh, but really, it's just a fake. You you've created it. You mapped it inside of the server environment. It doesn't even know that it's running inside of a browser, and it doesn't have to care, which is cool. So the it would be great if you could write up a description, and maybe this is a, a short blog post or some documentation or something like that um, describes the overall topology of, of what lives where, so that. I think broadcasting that would also really help other browser vendors when they're thinking about how they can, like what, because I, I think some, you know, most browsers are looking at this and they see IPFS as this really big standalone project with this entire stack and I have to buy into all this stuff. But what you have shown here is that you don't. You actually just need a few of these core network primitive APIs and an operating environment that looks like Node and call it good. Everything, everything just works. So I'd, I'd love for you to be able to, sh for you to share the simplicity of this approach so that others can have an idea of, of the, the nuts and bolts of how it happened. Yeah, we, we did something similar for that uh, last year for LibDWeb. Uh, there's like a pay, like just an overview of LibDWeb experiment in uh, Companion. I think we could start with adding something similar to the docs directory and eventually it could grow to a blog post. Uh, I did not uh, like uh, submit a like, PR yet because I want to figure it out uh, this uh, like server mode basically like f being able to to accept connections from other uh, others before I like actually make a PR ready for review because it's possible that we'll end up having to create custom modules or something and I just want to uh, avoid some uh, avoid uh, noise on that uh, level but it's like super super exciting so I I just wanted to share it. It's amazing. I, I will say too that when when we were writing LibDWeb, that was one of the things that we found is that the uh, act, uh, act, acting as a client as opposed to acting as a server exercised code paths that were uh, very very different, and the performance characteristics of of that code was was really challenging. So as soon as we started listening on the network. Uh, or broadcasting that we were accessible as a resource on the network from MDNS, but also the TCP server code inside a, uh, a giant ball HTTP client uh, think things we found places we found we found challenges so I, it, it might be it might be yeah it, it might be really different this is the first time brave is probably ever well maybe not that brave has used those those uh, uh, Chrome sockets APIs so these are un, un, probably not well tested code paths in brave even though they might be for Chrome OS I, I believe uh, those API, like the only other uh, consumer of those APIs in Brave is WebTorrent at this point. And, and it probably is using the same polyfills. That, that would be really good to figure out. I, I did not realize that they were using those same, they were using that same infrastructure. Yep. I just had a thought. It would, it, what would be cool is if, um, okay. if we had some uh, 
some yeah. module or yeah. polyfill that would make the Chrome APIs look like libdweb? Because then we already have um, lib, like in Firefox, we can use libdweb uh, and, and we have a libp 2 p TCP or libdweb transport and discovery. Um, and we could use those same ones in Chrome-like browsers if they expose the libd web API. Uh, sort of, but, but the other way around. So uh, the, uh, the problem with libd web is that uh, the in our integration uh, from 2018 was based on the protocol handler API. So we did not like spawn local HTTP gateway we just like injected payload to the handler, uh, and that's not something we can polyfill. However, uh, we had discussion around the DWeb, LibDWeb project that similar to what we have uh, in Brave on top of like Chrome sockets, we got polyfills for net DGRAM modules. Uh, I believe we have a DGRAM polyfill on top of LibDWeb. I don't think we have the net one. So uh, there's a libdweb org, org on GitHub when we started collecting those polyfills for libdweb. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, we will end up having uh, net and dgram, probably maybe DNS as well, uh, for on top of libdweb. And we could do the same thing there that we are doing here for Brave. The only difference is this like protocol handler and the, which changes uh, the dynamic in the location bar, but also how the browser handles stuff. So it's no longer regular HTTP, it's like something else. Uh, I had a brief discussion with Brave, uh, raising a need like that there's this API in LibDWeb, and in, in, if they plan at some point in the future of adding the more low level integration, that would be a template. So we don't invent a separate multiple APIs just to use something that works and was proven. But yeah, exciting times. Did you? I, I also would encourage a more node focused approach that libd web API was pretty specific to what we had available in Firefox and wasn't really optimized for, uh, for, for any specific implementation that one of the things that we kept coming back to was, Maybe we should maybe we should just write polyfills for all of the node network stack and file system and and just and then have protocol handler. Protocol handler really stands out like the browser specific API that has no corollary in in node. And once you have some level of of node compatibility through polyfills, all kinds of other stuff just kind of works. Then so you can level up that that whole ecosystem, and you're also you have a workflow that works uh, for developers that already have tooling and everything, whereas the investment in making libdweb better only only narrows because the the path to getting libdweb to exist in other places outside of Firefox is I, I, I think unclear is not a strong enough way to describe the challenges there. Got it. I, my understanding of libdweb was more kind of weed it was created as a kind of this is what we could expose um and uh and like uh that so what i'm getting at is that in node.js if we if we just say that we need to have like node like apis it's kind of all or nothing and there's no like um well you know, you can have DGRAM, but you need all of the bits of that for it to, for people to be able to use it. Um, so there's no like, we can only have half of this because it doesn't fit in with the security thing. And I, and I figured that the DWeb was kind of that sweet spot where it's like, well, we can expose these bits. Um, and uh, and so that's the only reason why I was suggesting that. I agree that like- yeah, that, That's exactly right. That's, we were like, what is, the, what is the smallest bit of functionality that we could possibly expose? That would give to it, us to, yeah, yeah, let DAT and let SSB and let IPFS run. I, I agree that having, just having no, uh, like a node style API in, in there would be amazing and, uh, and would, would enable stuff, but it's, it is all or nothing, I guess. Um, but yeah, yeah, all good. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely 
the event calculus that we gave that we're gonna evaluate the the time it would take to make a node compatible polyfill is really a lot of work. Something uh, like something to think about is that maybe uh, uh, to, we could abstract some sp like low level stuff related to Chrome sockets and also leave the web by creating like a common high level API just to hide those two. So <laughs> that's just in, like that adds a new API instead of like reusing the node one. Um, at the same time, uh, we may not need like all the APIs. We, I don't think we actually like the the policy we use right now. Does I don't I'm not sure if it implements entire net package. Uh, it just implements enough to have like HTTP server to run fine to open sockets by our transport without any need for changing any code. Uh, maybe just be good enough. Uh, with some KVATs or just like throwing uh, error of four methods that are not supported in this uh, runtime. Yeah. yeah, I guess you just have to be explicit about which parts you are. And, um, yeah, just good docs or something. If I, I would encourage that or Alan's idea of just using libdweb as the API that we polyfill to, as, a, as opposed to a, a third polyfill, polyfill, polyfill. Yeah. Polyfill wrapper. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's a that's a good idea. If if anything, we would we should like pick LibDweb instead of Chrome sockets. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess that's it for this. Um, next one is uh, drop in. Maybe I'll share a screen. It will be easier. Um, drop in a config to override things like contact type at HTTP gateway. So let's make it less green. It's a happy topic. Yeah, so we have HTTP gateways and some people like to, would like to use IPFS for hosting websites. Um, and there are some edge cases around content type uh, when a file is uh, returned by our HTTP gateway with invalid content type which either breaks some images like svg uh, images sometimes get uh, interpreted as uh, xml or plain text and then browser re refuses to render it even though it loaded fine there are some like less popular content uh, file types which uh, are used by applications and application require this specific file type to be returned by HTTP server with specific content type. Without that, it does not work. So there are multiple use cases where content type uh, returned by HTTP gateway uh, causes problems or makes uh, things uh, harder for people. And we've been discussing uh, poten potential solutions of how to solve this, how to enable people to specify or overwrite content type. Because right now, when you request a file from the gateway, what happens behind the scenes is Go IPFS or JSIPFS is basically doing uh, mime sniffing. It looks at the header, uh, it looks at a few bytes from the header of the file, and based on some magical uh, uh, byte codes, it recognizes, oh, this is uh, this type of image always starts with those bytes, so this is probably uh, uh, JPEG or something. Um, so that's a problem because it's pro it relies on third-party library to always do content sniffing in a deterministic uh, way, and those libraries get updated. Also, uh, we look at the file extension. However, the file extension may change or may not always be present. Uh, so there are some, there are some examples uh, here on the issue I linked. However, the potential solutions are one, the first we discuss is to just embed content type with the data itself 
So when you add a file to IPFS, you would pass a flag and specify this is an XML file or this is a, a zip file, and that content type would be added to metadata and would travel with the data itself. Uh, the problem is that requires like changes to low-level plumbing, and also it changes the DAG itself, because when you add something to the DAG, it changes the, if you add something to metadata, it will change the final CID. So if you already have stuff on IPFS and you want to add content type to it this way, the CID would change. Uh, so the second idea is something uh, we discussed with Steven on Monday, and also Eric uh, mentioned, uh, made a good case uh, along those the same lines in a related discussion about uh, metadata for Unix FS v1. So basically the idea is to, instead of embedding a content type in the DAG itself or in the blocks of the data, we would come up with some special directory or a special config file uh, that people could just drop without having them to know low-level plumbing stuff of IPFS. So the idea is, maybe uh, the good abstraction is uh, how historically we had that HD access files, <laughs> or, or, or maybe that's not a good example. Maybe better example is how uh, git attributes, uh, a file called git attributes could be dropped in any directory of your project, and you could define you could override the type of a file. You could define that this file is a binary and it should be not have like uh, end line uh, characters translated and stuff like that. We could come up with something similar for content types. So just a file you drop in a directory uh, saying this file is this content type. And then when someone loads the data from HTTP gateway, uh, the HTTP gateway itself would check if that file is present, and if it's present, then it would disable content sniffing, and it would just set the content type to the one uh, from the file. And that would be a uh, easy convention for people to just override the behavior of the gateway. Initially, that could be just the content type, but also we could customize error pages that way. Uh, so it's just a, like an idea separate from uh, embedding content type in uh, the UNIXFS metadata. And it's probably something we should discuss with the Gateway team, but I think it's also related to web browsers. So wanted to pick your brains if anyone has any questions or... Uh, yeah, so the question uh, from Alan is who would create uh, this file? So the way I see it is that the, those config files would be uh, created by website owner. So if you are publishing a website on IPFS, you just add this file to the directory you created with the website. And that's why we need to be very specific that it's only for overriding content type. Uh, You go paste the link, and now I. So would that be a tool that creates it? If you're like you've got a, is it IP? Is it when you add stuff to IPFS, it automatically gets created? No, I th I believe that should be a, an optional feature of the gateway itself. It should be just scoped to the gateway. So when uh, the gateway prepares response for a request. It checks if that file is present. If the file is present, then it would uh, override the content type. Yeah, I get it on the kind of reading end, but I'm more like when it's first written, oh, when it's first created, it, like is it like if I add stuff to IPFS, does IPFS create that file for me? Um, so that when the gateway reads it, it can it, it's there. Like there's, I, a, there's a kind of keeping it in sync issue, but also creating it in the first instance issue yeah. I have questions well like just question marks over I guess yeah yeah so uh, I think the good way to think about this is it's an override so by default nothing changes the gateway will continue doing content sniffing if in the future we have uh, this uh, metadata in UNIXFS then it would use that however 
there would be an, an, a simpler way of overriding content type that does not require changing in UnixFS or anything. It would just require adding one check uh, in HTTP gateway code. Just check if this file, this like that IPFS content types or something exists. And if it exists, I, it, would, it would use a content type from that. And it would be specifically an override. So it would disable content type sniffing. It would set content type from the file and it would probably, it probably should also add this uh, X content type uh, options uh, header uh, with no sniff parameter to disable sniffing on the client. So it would tell browser, don't do any sniffing, use this content type. Um, Good. Um, okay. But it, essentially, it has to be authored manually by the person who wants to override the con content type. Yes, it, it's not something people would do all the time. It would be only for those rare cases when someone needs to uh, fetch data from uh, HTTP gateway, but it needs to have a specific content type. And, it, and that person wants to have the same content type no matter from which gateway it's fetched. So that is why this configuration would travel with data itself, similar to like the, the git attributes uh, config file, instead of like uh, what Hugo linked. Uh, in NJX, you can overwrite content types, but that's like specific to the server. And that's the problem. Like if we change that only on our gateway, <laughs> it, other gateways would continue having the same thing. So that's why the idea is to have it uh, travel with data itself. And it's just scoped to the uh, HTTP gateway. Um, yeah. Did you? Is the lab content types something that people who are not using gateways have as well? Like it feels, I guess this feels kind of like some of the same concerns as Alan thinks, like keeping this in sync and who does the authoring seems to be complex and and just kind of a stopgap for the for the underlying issue that seems like it would be present in full nodes as well. That we would need to know the content type in order to know what to do with it in a client like a browser. So if you swap out gateways in the same scenario with Brave running embedded full node and somebody loads IPFS colon slash slash CID, you still have the same problem. So uh, is yeah. that true? Yes, okay. so, so the, the idea is this would not solve the problem when you request the data using its CID. Uh, it's specifically to make it easier for people to host websites on IPFS. So specifying content type, uh, when you publish a website to IPFS, you don't have just one text file. You have a directory, and in that directory, you have index.html, you've got some assets. You may have some, some directories. And the, how you would overwrite a content type in this uh, scenario is you would just add this dot .ipfs subdirectory with additional metadata. Uh, yes, but I guess I'm asking, it, as, like the gateways are a transition point to a world where we don't need gateways anymore, right? And and in like you know right now we're at we're at 0.5 or less, and, and not even to 0.5 in this implementation. So if there's any time to think about what are the walls that we're hitting in terms of protocol design and common use cases, this would be the the like we're running out of time if we want to get to a 1.0 at some point. And so I guess for is I guess I'm asking the bigger the broader question is it are we gonna hit this again later? Are we gonna just is this pushing kicking the can down the road till IPFS is everywhere and we're like, man, I wish we had content types built into the protocol, built into the metadata. And I, I feel like there's there's no there will never be a better time to ask that question, and there will never be a better time to make backwards incompatible changes. So I, I guess like the, I feel like the context for, for making these types of decisions, we can put a bunch of work into uh, something that's gateway specific and website specific, but if the protocol has a broader issue around this, 
I would, I would like to answer that question before going down the solutions road. Oh yeah, totally. And uh, I sort of linked that like uh, on the ideas to explore on the issue I linked, uh, there is link to uh, addressing this at the protocol level. So I want to be a very specific, this discussion is only about content type at HTTP, HTTP gateway. Is there anything we can do sooner to make it easier for people uh, to, to publish websites and host the websites on IPFS before that happens? So if uh, there's proposed change in Unix FS v2 to support embedding content type with the data itself, and that's sort of what you mentioned, that it sol sort of solves the problem at the protocol level, because once you when you add this metadata, when you add data to IPFS, it will be always there. And when gateway, when you request that data from IPFS, uh, the gateway will see that, oh, this data already has content type and it will not, not do anything. It will just use the content type that's shipped with the data itself. The problem is sort of like uh, what happens between now and then there will be time, like people continue using IPFS for publishing websites and uh, adding this sort of uh, an override could make it easier before that lands because we've been talking about Unix FS v2 for years and I think it still got postponed and uh, maybe we could uh, make it easier for people sooner than later and there's a separate discussion that there could be times when someone wants to take an existing data that has content type embedded and still override that. They may want to have some, uh, some uh, specific format that has like versioning in the content type and they want to like artificially bump the version or something. Um, that could be a solution. So it's not like or, it's and. You could, uh, we yeah. could, those both things could uh, live together and this uh, overwrite would be specific to HTTP gateway just to make a translation between IPFS protocol and HTTP semantics easier for people. Um, yeah, I guess, so I, I guess my concern comes from, so I, I, I totally agree that you, even once you have metadata built into the protocol, you might also need to be able to overwrite at times. Totally, that's something we could, but we can cross that bridge when we get to it. We understand better what the shortcomings of the built-in metadata approach would be. And I, I guess my concern comes from things like the conversation around WebSocket star and uh, where we have lots of, there's like a history of stop gaps that we've invested years into. And then you say things like, like but you know, XFSV2 for years. But I guess I'm like, at this point, I'm like, if we really want to get to a 1.0 and we want to solidify what the protocol can do, I would encourage that identifying stop gaps making the conscious decision to lean harder into what we think the ultimate solution needs to be and focusing our very limited resources and engineering efforts on shipping the, the world that we want it to be instead of investing more time into, into that, that middle term. Because I'd be like, okay, like I'd rather have a comprehensive view of what websites on IPFS needs and then focus on that. And even if it means we need to make the hard decision to say, Yep, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna be ready again until end of 2020 or something like that, as opposed to porting more time into uh, infrastructure that eventually people aren't gonna need anymore. Yep. Totally, but in this totally, case, it sounds like there's there still might be utility for it. Later. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And I'm I sort of uh, feel it's a uh, it's still there's as long as there are HTTP gateways, and I'm pretty sure those will not go away anytime soon, there will be need for overriding content type. Uh, and it's not like blocking, uh, adding uh, content type to the Unix FS itself. Uh, it's just like a separate feature of the gateway itself. Um, and we, it, it was like mentioned multiple times. So I just like documented the idea and uh, it, it's, it's there. Maybe we'll pick it up with a gateway team at some point. I, w I know that they are planning to support custom error pages. So if you like drop uh, 404 that HTML, that will like override the default uh, error page. 
So I feel it's sort of like a similar if there's like yeah. a convention of having like dot IPFS slash and then you have like four or four HTML, the content type overwrite would be just another config file that you drop there. Uh, but that's, yeah, it, it might be easier to reason about too if we had a list of what the biggest problem, what are the biggest content type problems that people hit? Like if this was is this if this was designed around a very specific a specific use case and specific set of content types that this happens to all the time. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But that's why also uh, so Alan mentioned that uh, the override won't work if you request uh, data directly uh, using its CID. I totally agree. But uh, the specific use case for this is like hosting websites or like hosting uh, data sets with specific content type. So you are always wrapping them in some directory. Um, we cannot do much with uh, requesting direct, uh, like file directly. There is like a, a file name uh, parameter that you can pass and that would override both <laughs> how the URL ends and also would add content disposition header uh, so, so the gateway would re return and suggest the file name in content disposition header. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I think that this is out of scope. We mostly are, like personally, I, were, I just want to make it easier for people to host stuff on IPFS, uh, host websites on IPFS. And for now, that means uh, some sort of a gateway access. All right. Uh, I guess we've run this one down. <laughs> uh, if anyone has any strong opinions, or uh, please comment on the, on the issue. At least there's an issue now that we can link if we have uh, future discussions, because it comes back over and over. Uh, all right, next one is re relative paths. On yeah, this is an issue I filed on, on IPFS deploy. Uh, thanks for looking at it so far. I still feel like I don't fully understand. Like I, I have tried both dot slash relative paths or no slash relative paths. And it seems like both of those are equivalent relative paths that should work. But, uh, but so like that Hawk, Hawk's test was uh, basically the same as mine. Like it's just a, just a page with a relative path to a, to a style sheet. I, yeah, so I, I, I did not uh, look at uh, the updates on, on that issue. However, I know that we had issues with various static website generators. Uh, and the problem there was that in the code you, you, like you wrote, uh, in the template, you used like those valid rel relative paths. However, the engine which was generating static website took those paths and broke them, either by defaulting to the root on the root or, or replacing them with absolute paths. But usually when stuff breaks, it's when a static website generator replaces those relative paths with, uh, like relative to the root and makes them starting at the root. I know that uh, in, we had those, those problems with Hugo, but there's now like an option to, to tweak it off. Uh, I'm not sure. Are you using any specific website generator or is it like handcrafted? I, this was a handcrafted HTML file with a handcrafted CSS and JavaScript file that I know exactly what I published and uploaded. And I tried it through IPFS deploy and then directly through IPFS add as well. All right. So it would it really means it, it seems like that it, that the gate, that the gateway configurations are different. Are you like in, experiencing the same problem on uh, like our gateway, local gateway, and other gateways, or? Local gateway seemed to work fine. I couldn't get it to load through our public gateway yesterday. Yeah, I, I think we could. It makes it harder to test too. Yeah, we, sh we should like cross check with uh, at least one yeah. other third party gateway just to ensure it's not like a configuration option a problem with our gateway. Um, I think we, we had some, uh, no, that was not related to this one. Uh, probably we should look at this uh, async because uh, I'm not sure if we can, unless someone has any idea on this call. 
what could go wrong? It, it really looks like it might be a, a different, like the, the same two files work fine when I IPFS add and then they don't when I IPFS deploy and it and load, it's loaded through Infura. So I'll, 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 maybe I'll just uh, make a test that pushes it to a bunch of different gateways and checks and sees what the return headers are. Yeah, that's a, a very good point is that you, we, we sort of assume the response from HTTP gateway is just a response, no matter from which gateway you request it. And we've seen that different gateways have not only different behaviors, some gateways block videos, some gateways disable content type sniffing. Uh, yep. We, we, we talked earlier about a, a gateway spec. And maybe. And, and interrupts test too. Yeah. Yeah. Lots, lots of gateway stuff to do. Uh, anyway, we don't, we don't need to fix this here. I just thought if anybody had thoughts about what the issues might be. The next item I had was kind of about issues like this. Where do we find like, developer experience stuff? So if I'm a basic web developer, just doing RPMS add my files and I have some issues uh, in their workflow, do we have a place where we kind of collect developer experience and developer workflow issues uh, broadly? I'm not familiar with like implementation agnostic repo. Probably not. Uh, we have docs. Maybe just like create a new repo, like. Yeah, or maybe the, yeah, maybe this is a section of the docs. I mean, we still need to track the issues somewhere. So if that if there are developer workflow issues that we need to be able to document, maybe we file those in the in the docs repo. We have a representative of somebody who's been working with the docs group here today with us, Mr. Waring. Do you have any suggestions? How, how have you all been talking in that group around uh, developer experience issues and how to track them and where to put them? Sorry, I think I'm either you broke up or my line was terrible then, so I missed that whole question. Um, and now you're muted, so I, I, prob I, I probably <laughs> broke up. It's happening all the time. Please repeat. I'll happily answer. Um, are, are, is the docs and developer experience group tracking these types of issues? Do you have a plan for where to put developer experience and developer workflow issues? Should we just take all these issues and file them in your repo? Sounds good. Thanks. Yes, exactly. There's no one primary place for it. Uh, essentially, as things have been coming in and we've got a bigger bucket for it, we start organizing things. So uh, I'd say if you have already got a system for collecting or collecting those things, then I would continue with that. That's a good home for the meantime. But um, we have been uh, just opening issues on the docs um, repo uh, for tracking a lot of the stuff. Um, yeah, we're trying, I think WX side of things, we haven't gone that deep in the rabbit hole yet. It's more kind of, uh, more in the content landscape at the moment. Uh, so yeah, we should probably spin up a, a section to, to go deeper into that. Uh I, I got so, sort of like a question uh, until we, we get a better idea how to handle this. Would it work just to have a dedicated label in like docs repo or something? That way we could like move all those issues to a separate repo if we figure out we need a, just a separate place? Yeah, because I think it would make more sense to have individual issues for each one of these things because they're going to they're gonna blow out quite quickly rather than having one master issue that's just a threat of noise. <laughs> so a uh, label will probably be a very smart way of doing it. So um, okay to that. And maybe Eric could suggest a way where we could consume that into our Zendesk, uh, our Zen, um, Zen Hub board. So um, we've got some current labels set up on there based on the design. Uh, things that basically come into our ice boxes and we can then do our card sorting through that a bit easier. I think he, he dropped almost <laughs> at, the, at the second you said his name. Magic. It always happens. Yeah. <laughs> Has to get the door. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, let's sort that out. Uh, let's start with the labels, see how that works out, and we can then migrate to somewhere more sensible if that's better. Sounds great. I think, I think docs is probably at least a natural first start for, for that kind of stuff and, until we have like a, a full-time DevRel person who's managing that kind of thing. Uh, and the only other thing I had is uh, uh, Hugo and Lytle and I are going to meet for a couple of days at the end of the month to do some web browser roadmapping 
and planning. If you, if you have any, any special requests, topic ideas, uh, let, us, let us know. Trying to figure out where uh, my connection is so bad today. Try to, try to figure out what the browser landscape is going to look like in 2020. Browsers, got to pick them all. I just uh, want to encourage everyone to, uh, if you have any like issues, questions, wishes around web browsers, uh, just drop uh, uh, open an issue in IPFS slash in web browsers repo. I'll add a link to, to notes to agenda, um, so we can like account that while doing our planning. Is that the meeting where we decide to build our own browser? <laughs> no. <laughs> Shh, this is a public meeting. I did have a, uh, I do have a, a project that I was taking the, the Mozilla reference Android browser and, and then doing what Sam Macbeth did and playing around with what, what it would be like to bundle IPFS Companion in as a web extension with libd web in that but um ex experimental that's that's a that's a far cry from a from a full browser yeah but like uh, on the mobile it's pretty interesting proposition because i'm always every time i use like firefox for android it's like so it's like so good because it, like the sync is there, extensions work, and you have like one click to switch between like mobile and desktop rendering mode. Not sure if everyone is aware, it's really good. And, uh, and companion works with embedded nodes. It, work, right. like, it works for uploading files to IPFS on the go. Right. And, 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 and that's one of the things where I feel like we don't have a, it, it's an easy utility. I like the idea of, and we are not building a browser. If we're going to do something like that, it would be interesting to ship it as a mobile utility as a, as a tool. Um, and the, 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 the bar for that is, is pretty low in terms of just getting it basically functional due to the, the fact that the reference browser work is already done and the uh, companion work is already done and LibDWeb gets us a way to meld them together. The, the, challenge with embedded node there is that the APIs for things like MDNS and listening sockets, uh, TCP server sockets are, uh, are less, e even dodgier on uh, mobile than they are in Firefox desktop. There be dragons. Yeah, but for, for sure the utility aspect of just like not inventing too much, but just like getting what we already have and packaging it together. Not sure how it looks on iPhone, on iOS. However, on Android, you got all this scheme of intents. So you can like share something to other app and this app could be like receiving text or data or pictures and would we'll just take care of adding it to IPFS. And that's probably the number one use case people would have. Yeah, on one of the experiments that I wanted to do too, I started poking around at the web share API that, that Chrome implements for PWAs on Android. So there you could actually have like just IPFS, upload to IPFS as in the share menu. And now that probably small, but it doesn't even require full nib. So there's some, there's some fun experiments to be had. Yeah, I think even if these don't become functional prototypes, even doing a paper exercise to, pump, to kind of make it, uh, so like this is what we could have and spark some imagination. Um, yeah, we, we could do more of that. I'd be excited to participate. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe one of these weeks in this meeting, uh, you or Eric could walk us through a paper prototyping of one of these things. I'm straight, a big ass.
we got we got 40 seconds so if <laughs> if any last minute topic or question raises speak up I, i'm dying to to see what what someone what uh, chris or i think it was chris said how he finished the sentence maybe eric can you're on time Literally, now. my battery died that second on my Mac. <laughs> but we could follow that up. There would be a recording. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll look at the recording. <laughs> All right. I think that that's it. Let's wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining this call. And see you next week. Bye.